Hi everyone. So in this video, I'm going to go over um, understanding solutions, determining if uh, IV saline is isotonic, and we're going to use a calibration curve very similar to in a previous experiment. So uh, that's kind of that. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about what osmotic pressure is, and you may have seen this before, so this may be a reminder, but I just do want to talk about a little bit about what that is, not in great detail. So basically, um, in osmosis, uh, water will flow from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. Said another way, nature tends to dilute solutions. So if we look here in this uh, U-shaped tube, what we have is on one side pure water and on the other side salt water in our case. Now this could be different solvents and solutes. In this case our solvent is water and our solute is uh, salt, but basically um, it works in a similar way. So what happens here is that um, the water through this semi-permeable membrane is able to pass, but the salt ions are not able to pass through this semi-permeable membrane. So water can move and salt can. And what you're going to find is the rate at which water flows in this direction is greater than the rate at which it flows towards the pure solvent. Said another way, it flows towards the solution more than it flows towards the pure solvent. And if we come back sometimes later, what you'll see is there's actually more liquid in the solution side because some of the water has flowed towards this. And and you end up with this difference in height, which could be understood as an osmotic pressure. That's not super important for here. What's super important for here is to know that nature tends to dilute solutions and that uh, pure water will flow towards salt water and not the other way around. So that's basically how it works. If you want to think about this kind of um, from a molecular level, the salt ions act like little magnets and they attract the water molecules. So that's effectively um, a simplified way of thinking of what's going on. So the salt molecules, um, the water molecules want to be near the salt molecules, so they move uh, towards it and you end up with a greater volume of solution then you end up with a pure water. Now if we think about this in terms of cells we can think of this in terms of the cell wall as being the semi-permeable membrane. So the cell wall is a semi-permeable membrane and it turns out that the osmotic pressure of our um, like blood is 0.9% NaCl. Now you don't have to use NaCl as the solvent, or excuse me, as a solute. You can use other things like glucose, for example. Um, but in this case, um, we're going to use NaCl as the solute. So what we're looking at here is an isotonic case. So if we have 0.9% NaCl, water will flow into and out of the cells at the same rate because the osmotic pressure inside of the cell or the concentration of solute inside of the cell is 0.9 percent and the concentration of salt water outside the cell is also 0.9 percent so water flows in and out evenly if we put it in at what's called a hypotonic solution which is less than 0.9 percent including pure water the water flows in why because the point not it's 0.9 percent nacl inside the cell and zero percent nacl if it's pure water outside the cell so water flows into the cell well what can happen the swell the cells can actually blow up like a balloon and they may actually burst and this is called hemolysis if they actually burst and this is a common way to um, destroy cells if you're looking to get something from inside of the cell for example if you're doing um, biochemistry type of research. We can also have what are called hypertonic solutions where the, where the concentration is greater than 0.9%. So now it's 0.9% inside the cell and greater than 0.9% outside of the cell. So this is, for example, like seawater, for example, would be about 3.5% at ACL. So this would be a hypertonic solution. In this case, the water flows out of the cell because it flows into the higher concentration outside of the cell. And this can cause the cells to um, shrivel up and potentially die. So this is basically um, just a little introduction to osmotic pressure and osmosis. And it's not super important here, uh, but it is what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out if the unknown solution is basically safe to, to be used inside of a person. Obviously, it's not actually safe because it's not sterile or anything like that. Um, but, you know, we're trying to determine uh, whether or not, you know, if we work for a company who makes... Um, saline solutions that go in IVs for uh, to put into people, well, does it have the right concentration? Because it's, as you can see from this, it's very important that it has the right concentration. So the next thing we want to talk about is a calibration curve, and you've done this before. So what a calibration curve allows us to do is it allows us to 
place something that's easily measurable, in this case, conductivity, which we're going to measure with a conductivity probe, and we'll show you that in a little while, and versus the salt water concentration in percent uh, by mass. Okay, so we're going to make a 1.2, a 1.1, a 1, a 0.9, and a 0.8 percent salt water solution, and then we're going to um, use that to determine uh, the concentration of our unknown. So effectively what we do is we make these five solutions. We measure their conductivities and we plot them on this graph. So now we know the conductivity of these different solutions. So let's say that our unknown has a um, conductivity of 9,000. Well, if you look here, 9,000 is about right here. And you can see that about halfway between these two lines, the concentration is somewhere around 1.05% NaCl. So we can take the thing we can easily measure, conductivity, you just stick a probe down into the solution and you can measure its conductivity. And we relate it to the thing we want to know, the concentration by mass of salt in the solution, so that we can see if it's safe to inject in a person. And again, of course, this is not safe to put in a person because it's not sterilized or, it's, or anything like that. But you get the general idea. We can also use the equation of the line. So 9,000, if that was the conductivity of our unknown, would be a y value. We can then solve for x, which will be somewhere around 1.05 in this case, and we can determine the concentration of the unknown. This is called a calibration curve. It's very important that your calibration curve has an R squared of 0.99 or better. If it doesn't have an R squared of 0.99 or better, please consult your TA because you may need to remake a solution or something like that. Well, Needless to say, if we're going to um, make a calibration curve of known mass percent solutions, we're going to need a 1.2, oops, sorry, a 1.1, 1 .1, a 1, a 0.9, and a 0.8 percent solution. So in the next section, we'll talk about how we're actually going to make those solutions. So in the last experiment, we made all of the solutions by dilution. But in this experiment, we're going to do it a little bit differently. And the reason that we're going to do it um, a little bit differently is because um, we are starting with solid salt. So last time you started with 30% uh, alcohol or whatever you started with, but you started with a solution. And here you're actually going to start with solid salt, like you've all seen before, you know, on the table uh, to put on your food. So start by making 100 grams of 1.2% salt water. And in order to do that, what you're going to do is add approximately 1.2 grams of salt all right in this example we added 1.2015 grams you don't need to be quite that close um, but you need to add about 1.2 grams of salt and about 99 milliliters of water um, because 99 milliliters of water the density is around one is approximately 99 grams of water so you'll have a total of approximately 100 grams it might be a little bit over 100 grams but you're going to have approximately 100 grams total and then find the mass percent of your solution so so in this case, what we do is we take a 125 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask. This is an Erlenmeyer flask. The reason we use an Erlenmeyer flask is because when you swirl it, the stuff doesn't come out. If you use a beaker and you try to swirl that, the stuff comes out and we need to dissolve the salt. So we want to use the shaped flask that's made for swirling and dissolving the salt. So we're going to add, it says one gram here, but we're going to add about 1.2 grams of NaCl to our Erlenmeyer flask. We're then going to record that mass exactly. The easiest way to do this is to first put the flask on the balance and then hit the tear button that will zero it out. Once it's zeroed out, we add around 1.2 grams of salt. It's a good idea that the flask is dry because if the flask is dry and you add a little bit too much, you can still take some salt out. So we have the dry flask, we add around 1.2 grams. We then, not over the balance, we take the flask off of the balance, we pour in our 99 milliliters of water measured using a 100, graduate, 100 mil graduated cylinder, almost completely full. Okay, we pour in the water and then we measure the mass of the um, the salt and the water, or said another way, the total mass of the solution. Then we take the mass of the salt and we divide by the mass of the solution, we multiply by 100, and we find the exact mass percent of the solution. 
Once we have the first solution, which is going to be around 1.2%, don't worry, it's not going to be exactly 1.2%. Don't worry if it's not exactly, even if yours is 1.17 or 1.25, it doesn't really matter. Okay, as long as it's around 1.2% in the ballpark. Okay, then we're going to dilute it. And this is very similar to what you've done before. So now we're going to dilute the solution to make 20 milliliters of 1.1, 1 1.0, 1 0.9, and 0 0.8 percent NaCl. And to do dilution, we're going to use the dilution equation. Concentration 1 times volume 1 equals concentration 2 times volume 2. So in order to do that, we're going to um, first put in our initial concentration. We're going to make all of our solutions using our 1.2% solution. Note that your 1.2% solution is not going to be exactly 1.2000%. At least it's very unlikely that it will be. V1 is the variable. How much of the 1.2% solution do I need to add to make 20 milliliters of a 1.1% solution? C2, or your um, the concentration you're looking for, in this case is 1.1%, but you're going to have to repeat this for 1.9 and 0.8. And the volume is 20 milliliters. I missed the unit there. That should say 20 milliliters. I think I just forgot to copy it. All right, and when you do that, you get V1 equals 18.4 milliliters. What does this mean? It means we had 18.4 milliliters of the approximately 1.2% NaCl. It's not exactly 1.2%, no big deal. And 1.6 milliliters of water. How did we get to 1.6 milliliters of water? Well, 20 is the total volume of the solution, and 18.4 are this solution. So the rest of the 20, or 20 minus 18.4, 1.6 milliliters are water. And we're going to do this into a 50 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask. Again, we use this shaped flask so that we can swirl it and mix it up. These are also convenient for measuring um, the um, conductivity using a conductivity probe. It's super important that these um, solutions are made inside of this um, flask and that the flask is labeled. Okay, so you need to make sure that the flask is labeled because all of your solutions are going to look like a clear liquid and they're all going to be in the exact same size flask. If your lab partner moves something, you're not going to know which is which. So make sure you label this, you know, 1.1% or, you know, B if you prefer. Um, but make sure you label it some, uh, some way. I would write it as 1.1%. So now that we've talked a little bit about how to do this math, I want to um, show you in Excel how we can do this math. All right, so here we are in Excel, and we have our two masses. So you'll remember that we first teared our 125 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask, and we added 1.2015 grams of actual NaCl salt. All right, so then we wrote down the mass of the salt that we added. Remember, you don't need to be quite this close. If you have anywhere in the ballpark of 1.2, you're good. Then add 99 milliliters of water as measured with a graduated cylinder and record the mass of the entire solution. Again, you need to have your 99 milliliters of water ready because if you've teared that balance, you've put in the, um, you've taken out the mass of the flask, you need to add your salt, then add your water, and then measure, measure your mass before somebody else comes along and uses your balance and push this tear again. Because if they do that, it's going to screw it up. Um, because you're not going to know the mass of your actual flask doing it this way. So now we need to find the mass percent of this solution. So we hit equals the mass of the solute, in this case salt, divided by the mass of the solvent, in this case, um, or excuse me, the mass of the solution, in this case, uh, right around 100, times 100 because it's a percentage. So you'll notice we got the 1.1963% solution. And as I've talked about before, Jesse has, um, Excel is like a calculator. It doesn't do sig figs well. Don't worry about that. Okay, now we need to prepare this um, solution with a dilution. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to find um, the uh, desired percentage, how much of the approximately 1.2% we're going to use, and how much water we're going to use. Now what you need to remember is that this is not going to be exactly 1.2%. So we're going to use this, this value, not exactly 1.2%. So this is C1V1 equals C2V2. Specifically, it's C2 times V2, which is 20 milliliters, because we're trying to make 20 milliliters of solution, as I discussed before, divided by C1. So it's going to be um, C2, V2 over C1 gives me V1. 
how much of this that I want to use. Okay, it was 18.4 because we rounded before, and you can only really measure to one decimal place with a graduated cylinder. Now, how much water do you have to add? What you need to do is you need to do 20, the total volume, minus the amount of 1.2 that you're going to use, which if you recall before, it was 1.6. Now, I realize I made a mistake here. In this case, I don't want this cell to drop. So when I pull this down, I want this cell to be fixed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put two dollar signs here and here. This says stick on an F and stick on, in this case, 31. And then I hit enter. Okay. Now when I drag these down, it won't drag. The other way you can do this is when you click on this, if you hit F4 on a PC, it puts the dollar signs for you. And if you drag down, you can see that now we need to add 16.7 milliliters to make the 1% and 3.2 milliliters of this, then 15 milliliters and uh, roughly 5 milliliters, and then 13.4 milliliters and 6.6 .6 milliliters of water. And this will make all of the solutions that we need. Now, what I want to show you is, let's say you forget these dollar signs. So I'll just click this and I don't put dollar signs. When you drag down, you get these divide by zero errors. Why do you get those? Because it's dragging dragging this down to the next cell, and the next cell is divided by zero. So that's a problem. So you want to go ahead and just F4 that, and then pull down like this. I can't tell you how many times I've forgotten to do that. It's a lot. So if you forget, it's no big deal. Just go back and fix it. It only takes a second. Okay. So just reselect the cell and then hit F4 um, or just put the dollar signs in, whatever's easier for you. All right. Now you have all your recipes to make all of your solutions. So this can be very helpful. The next thing we want to do is we want to measure the conductivity of each of these solutions. So I'm going to turn it over to a live video where we show you how to measure the conductivity of the solutions. And I'm not 100% sure who's going to do that. It might be me, it might be Jesse, um, but we're going to show you that. All right, so here we are in the lab, and what I have here is a large beaker of water. We're going to use this to kind of rinse our conductivity probe. This is a conductivity probe uh, right here, and it, if you can see, I don't know if you can really see it, but the, there's like a hole where the solution gets in and it analyzes it, so it's right there, so you need to make sure your solution is above that. It also has uh, an old headphone jack, so make sure that you have the right conductivity probe. You don't have a, a thermistor, which has like an Ethernet cable jack, so that's basically that. I also have my 1% uh, solution here. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to um, plug in the conductivity probe into the microlab into the port that says conductance. And then once I've uh, plugged that in, I'm going to go ahead and start the microlab software. So what I'm going to do is minimize uh, the live video and uh, put the microlab software up on the screen. All right, to start the Microlab, so, uh, Microlab software, the first thing you want to do is make sure that your Microlab is turned on um, and you can see the on light. And then you want to go ahead and click the uh, Microlab software. And it's very important that you see this blue bar running across the screen. So let me um, just show you for a second uh, what happens if you don't see that. So what you'll see is it'll go load into this screen and I'm just going to go ahead and hit cancel and close this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the Microlab off all right, and then I'm going to click it again. And if I do that, what you'll see is this. If you see this and you don't see that blue bar crawl across the screen, the software and the microlab, uh, the computer and the microlab are not talking. So if I hit continue, I see the exact same screen, but I will get no measurements and no readings. And it can be confusing um, to try to uh, troubleshoot in this situation because it looks the exact same. So you need to be really careful that when you load the microlab software, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back on. When you load the microlab software, you do have this blue bar crawling across the screen. This means that your microlab and your computer are talking to each other, which is obviously pretty important. So the next thing that I want to do is once this loads up properly and everything's working, I want to click on microlab experiment. Once I click on microlab experiment, I'll get to this screen. When I do that, I want to hit add sensor. Okay. I want to choose in this case, the conductivity sensor. And on this version of microlab that plugs into this headphone jack right here. And then I want to click 0 to 20,000 microsiemens per centimeter. And I want to click use 
the factory calibration. Now you'll recall that this is in tap water. If we have DI water available, excellent, it'll read lower. Uh, but if we have tap water, it reads usually between 50 and 200, somewhere like that. In this case, it's reading about 130, and it'll change um, based on the microlab and based on the day of the week. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, minimize this again and try to get you uh, kind of a screen of the microlab and of the live view. Note that this is where we're reading the conductivity. And if it's in air, it should read zero because it should have no conductivity. Um, I'm just going to pull it out and just show you that. Okay, now it's not in the solution, but when I put it back in, it'll read the conductivity. So again, I'm going to just uh, minimize this so you can see both things on the same time. All right, so the conductivity is now kind of small, but you can see it right here and it's jumping around. I have it in my um, wash solution. So basically what I'm going to do is just swirl the conductivity probe in the solution and wash it off and then just kind of you know, try to tap as much of the water as possible off of it. You don't really need to dry it because it's only a few drops of water and 20 milliliters. It's probably okay. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of tilt my 1% solution a little bit, and I'm going to put the conductivity probe down in there so that it's nice and submerged. So I'm going to then just kind of swirl it, and you can see that the conductivity reading is increasing to somewhere around 88, uh, 8830 something like that. Now in the experiment, it says that it's 88.20, okay? Um, but, you know, I was just trying to guesstimate it here and they'll be a little bit different from uh, solution to solution. So you'll notice that that measurement is jumping around quite a bit as I swirl the conductivity probe into the solution. So once you've swirled it for about 30 seconds or so, um, just pick a reading, okay? So this one I'm gonna call 88.80. Okay, um, so 88.80 seems good. It went up to 88.90. That's probably okay if you wanted to put that, but something like that. Okay, it will change a little bit and it does tend to kind of go up as time goes on. And here it's even going into the 8900s or 89.10. So once you have a reading, okay, swirl it for about 30 seconds to a minute, then pick whatever you think is a good reading. Um, it does jump around, which I know is frustrating, but it is what it is and there's nothing I can do about that. All right, what you want to do is swirl it back in your beaker of water okay and tap it off after you've swirled it in the large beaker of water then into your next solution and you're going to re record all of your solutions note that for your 1.2 percent the original solution that you made you may not be able to measure that into the 125 million milliliter flask there may simply not be enough liquid in the bottom if that's the case just transfer it into a smaller flask and then make your measurement uh, from there so Hopefully, this gives you a good idea of how to use the microlab to measure your conductivity. Again, I know it's a little bit of a pain in the neck because the reading jumps around, but just pick your favorite reading after it's stabilized for 30 seconds to a minute. Thanks for watching. So now that we have our um, conductivities measured, what we want to do is uh, put them into Excel. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to use the exact 1.2% concentration. So if you'll remember, we didn't use exactly 1.2%. So again, we hit equals, that it tells Excel to do math or to reference another cell. And we just click on that and it tells us, the it puts the exact concentration of our top solution in. Note that by the way we made all the other solutions, these are their exact concentrations. So we don't need to um, fix these ones. We only need to fix the first one. And you'll also notice that we measured the conductivity of an unknown at 8,300. So if we just look here um, at these numbers, so 1.2, 1.1, 1.9, and 0.8, um, 8300 is very close to 0.9. So this is going to be the concentration of the unknown is going to be a little bit more than 0.9. But let's plot it and find out. So we highlight all of our data. We go to insert. We click on a scatter plot like this. Okay. And then if you go to this quick layout, you can find this where it nicely gives you um, the equation of the line and it makes the linear regression for you. And we can just delete this so it looks a little bit nicer and we can add our axes. So this is the mass percent on the bottom or the concentration. I guess I should put it as the concentration uh, by percent M over M. This is the conductivity. And that's in micro siemens. So if you want to really be um, careful, you can find the micro symbol. Okay, so you can 
um, insert that. Uh, micro Siemens per centimeter, to be technically correct. Okay, and then the chart title, I'm not gonna type this in for you, but it could be something like concentration of salt water versus conductivity. Um, so that's basically that. And you'll notice that we have this equation of the line and you'll notice that our R squared is 0.99 or better. That's really important. So what do we wanna do? Well, we wanna find the exact concentration of our unknown. We know it's somewhere around 0.9, but we don't know exactly what it is. So again, to get Excel to do math, we click equals. Note that conductivity, this is a y value. So this is a y. What's the first thing we want to do? We want to subtract this and then divide by this. Because we're subtracting first, we want to put this in parentheses because otherwise we're going to divide first because of order of operations, PEMDAS. So we just take the B70 and we divide by 335 or minus 335.0.9. 3, so first we subtract this and then we divide by that. Then we divide by our um, slope, which is 5441.1. So you'll recall, this is the um, slope and this is the y-intercept. So we effectively subtract our slope in this case, um, because we have a positive, um, excuse me, we subtract our y-intercept in this case, because we have a positive y-intercept and then we divide by our slope. And again, we have a positive slope because it is a positively sloped line. Then we hit enter and you can see it's not quite exactly 0.99, but it's right, or excuse me, 0.9, but it's right around 0.9 for the conductivity, which is exactly what we expected because 8,300 is right around 0.9. And in this way, if we were working for a company who was making this solution, we could determine that this solution was safe uh, to use with um, our uh, patients because it has the correct osmotic pressure and it's not going to hurt anybody. Note that our solutions are not sterile. I don't think anyone's going to try to inject them, but uh, you get the idea. These solutions are definitely not safe uh, for that. These are just, you know, for practice and understanding the calibration curve. So I hope you found this uh, video uh, helpful and thank you for watching.